Good afternoon, and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If this is your first time to the channel, hello and welcome. Today, we will be diving into a 47-year-old cold case. It was solved recently by using genetic testing. Let's get into it. Pamela Milam, a 19-year-old student, was studying at Indiana State University. Pamela, inspired by those who had taught her, was working towards becoming an English teacher. On September 15, 1972, ISU was having their rush week. Pamela had been a member of the Sigma Kappa sorority. She told some of her friends that she had wanted to move her car and she left the Homestead Hall. She said she would only be a few minutes, but never returned. Pamela didn't live on campus. She commuted to school daily from her childhood home, which she shared with her younger sister and parents. No one at the sorority party thought anything of Pamela not returning. They'd assumed she had just gone home. The next morning, however, Pamela didn't show up for work, and this concerned her family. It was very unlike Pam to be so irresponsible. The following day, two of Pam's friends spotted her 1964 Pontiac in the parking lot about a block away from where it had been parked the previous day. Through the window, they could see Pam's glasses in the vehicle. The girls called Pamela's home, and her father and sister Sheila decided to bring a spare set of keys to check out the car. When her father popped the trunk, what he saw would haunt him for the rest of his life. Pamela had been stuffed inside the trunk of her own vehicle. Her hands were tied behind her back, she had been gagged, and there was tape over her mouth. She had a rope around her neck, and the same rope was used to bind her hands. The thin white rope appeared to be a clothing line. She had leaves and dirt on her body and caught in the layers of her pantyhose and pants. There were no witnesses, but the police did a thorough investigation. The lead investigator insisted on collection of soil and any trace evidence, which at the time they had no way of testing, but he believed that science would one day catch up and it may be useful. DNA was collected from Pam's blouse. With no witnesses or enemies, the case very quickly went cold. Authorities believed that a man who had been arrested several weeks after Pamela's murder was responsible. He had been arrested in connection to several assaults on campus. However, police were never able to link Robert Wayne Austin to Pamela. No one knew at the time, but all the evidence that had been collected would eventually come to light and the investigator was correct, it would be used to find her killer. But for the time being, it would be tucked away in the back of a storage room, waiting. 36 years later, in 2008, newly appointed Terre Haute Police Chief Sean Keane handed out cold cases to each of his detectives. Keane felt it was unfair that all of his detectives had cases and he didn't, so he assigned himself the unsolved murder of Pamela Milam. Keane said that as soon as he opened the file, he couldn't put it down. He brought it home and irritated his wife by spreading out the crime scene photos in their living room. He tested the DNA from the scene and tested it against the lead suspect, Robert Wayne Austin, but was able to quickly eliminate him. It wasn't a match. He worked the case for 11 years, manually eliminating hundreds of suspects. In 2018, Keane made a decision that would either make the case or keep it cold forever. He sent the last usable sample of DNA to Parabon Nanolabs. We've talked about this before in other videos. This is the Virginia-based lab known for using DNA from companies like 23andMe and Ancestry.com to reverse engineer family trees. This company was most notable in identifying the Golden State Killer, John D. Miller, who murdered April Marie Tinsley, and William Talbot, 
who was arrested in connection to the murder of Jay Cook and Tanya von Kuhlenberg. If you haven't watched those videos, I will link them in the description box. Parabon was able to connect the DNA to a distant female cousin. From there, they mapped out additional family members and could begin narrowing a suspect down from the family tree. Based on the results, King conducted interviews and narrowed it down to a single suspect, Jeffrey Hand. Keen was disappointed to learn that Hand had already died, but using reverse paternal DNA testing, he confirmed with a 99% certainty that Hand had killed Pamela. Who was Jeffrey Hand, you might ask? Jeffrey Hand had been 23 at the time of Pamela's murder. Hand didn't live in Terre Haute, but he had lived there in some years past. In 1972, Hand had been working for a Chicago-based record company, delivering records to stores throughout Illinois and Indiana. He was around the age of university goers, he was familiar with the area, and this is what may have contributed to how he escaped unnoticed. He was young, had light hair, he had soft boyish features, he didn't look dangerous. He wouldn't have looked out of place in a university. In 1973, less than a year after Pamela's murder, Hand had picked up two hitchhikers, Jeffrey Thomas and his new wife. The couple were heading back from visiting friends in Chicago. Hand had picked them up just south of Terre Haute, and on the drive, he told the couple he needed to stop at his sister's house to see about getting some money. Hand pulled over and drew a pistol, and he demanded money from the couple. When they showed him they didn't have any money, which I mean may have explained why they were hitchhiking, Hand forced them into a grain bin and told them he was holding them for ransom. After waiting for a bit, Hand took Thomas out of his wife's sight. They were gone for a while, and while they were gone, she was able to escape the bin and run to a nearby home for help. When police arrived, they were able to easily arrest Hand. Hand also led them to Thomas's lifeless body that had been discarded in a weedy area. Thomas's autopsy revealed that he had been killed by a gunshot wound to the head, but had also been stabbed in the chest eight times and had his throat slit. His hands had also been tied behind his back, much like Pamela's had been. Hand never served time for the slain of Jeffrey Thomas. At his trial, he was found not guilty by reason of insanity for both the murder and the kidnapping charges. Although he wasn't found guilty, he was, however, committed to a state reformatory for two years. Hand's last and final encounter with the law was in January of 1978. In a mall parking lot, an off-duty officer was in the right place at the right time. He witnessed a man attempting to abduct a woman. He yelled out, at which point Hand ran. The deputy called for backup and pursued. Hand shot at the officer, injuring him. The gunfire was returned and Hand was wounded fatally as he ran away. Hand died as a result of his injuries in 1978 he was 29 at the time of his death. Pamela's family were relieved to hear Hand had not lived a full life. However, it was bittersweet knowing that he would never face justice for the years he stole from them. They were grateful that he had been stopped before any more young women could be harmed. I personally hope this is the last we hear of Jeffrey Hand and that his life of crime was short. Although, given that he had already established a pattern and preference, we may discover more crimes in the future that link to Jeffrey Hand. Once again, we are seeing a rising trend of cold cases being solved by new technologies. And I'd like to point out a commendable effort from officers like Sean Keane, who stuck by the cold case no matter how long it took to get it solved, but also the officers at the beginning of the case, the ones who 
even though they didn't know what exactly could be useful in the future, they still went ahead, they gathered a lot of evidence. And without their foresight, this case would have never gotten solved. A big thank you to all those involved. That is going to be it for today, and thank you for listening. If you want to support the channel, give this a thumbs up, and if you haven't subscribed already, please do. If you've already done those things and you still want to support me and the channel, please check out my description box. There's a link to send me a cup of coffee or a glass of wine. It really helps me get through the editing and research. I also have a donation page for equipment upgrades, and this month's goal is to upgrade my microphone. I know a lot of you guys always give me inconsistent feedback on my mic quality or my sound quality, so I want to get something that will help me be a little more consistent. Thank you all for your support. I appreciate it greatly. I will see you next time. Have a good day. Bye.